What's going on, everybody? It's the Scene Snob here, and this is the Scene Snobs podcast. This is actually just a quick intro. It's a very special episode because I did my first interview for the site uh, with director Rodman Flender about his new movie, Eat Brains Love, and his storied career. So uh, what you're about to see is uh, we sat down at the Alamo Draft House. Uh, Psycho Cinema put on his movie, Eat, Brain, Eat Brains Love, and you know I got to see it after the interview, and it was terrific. Go check out my review of it on the Scene Snob Reviews on the YouTube channel. Uh, remember, give us likes, uh, give us a uh, follow at The Scene Snob on um, Instagram, and Twitter, or Facebook, uh, The Scene Snob's channel on YouTube. So, uh, really look forward to it. Uh, hope you guys enjoy it. I know I was a little shaky because I'm the first one, a little nervous, but Rodman was a great guy. Had a great conversation with him. And uh, just enjoy. Here you go. Here's my interview with Rodman Flender. Thanks, guys. Welcome to the Scene Snob's podcast. I am your host, Mick Manhattan, and uh, I'm joined here today by acclaimed producer, director, writer, and actor, Rodman Flender, uh, from such movies as Idle Hands, The Unborn, uh, various TV shows like The Office, Tales from the Crypt, uh, some of my favorites, Party of Five, uh, and we're at the Alamo Draft House, and uh, Rodman, how you doing today? I'm well, how are you? Doing well, doing well. You're from New York City, which uh, I know very well from being just from Jersey City. Yes, well, your last name is Manhattan, so... Yes, yes, well, I did live in Brooklyn for a little while. Okay. So I, I wanted to ask you about that. So, um, you, your mother was a Broadway dancer, right? Uh, she was. Yeah, she did. She was. She was. She was in her in her youth. She was a teenager in her twenties. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. And your father was a writer and screenwriter, correct? Exactly. Yeah. Oh, perfect. So I, I can see where you get the, you know, the love and the passion for just not performing, not just performing, but also the writing and, and the technical side. Right. Yeah. Well, the arts. Uh, was in my house growing up. As you said, my dad was a writer. He had written, uh, before I was born, he had written for television um, uh, for people like way before either of our time, like people like Sid Caesar and the show of shows and Car 54, where are you, that kind of stuff. And uh, then he, when, when TV moved to LA, he wanted to stay in New York and pursue um, more, more serious endeavors, um, novel writing. And one of his novels, was, one of his first novels, was a, a, a book really ahead of its time. It's called Paris Blues, and um, it really it kind of explored racism in America. And it was about a uh, black jazz musician who moves to Paris to escape racism. And it was turned into a movie. And when it was turned into a movie, uh, they actually made uh, in the book the, the the black musician is, is the lead of the book and he has kind of a white friend but and they made the movie in 1962 and in the movie they made his white friend the lead Paul uh, Newman and made the the African American character kind of the the, the second banana which is Sidney Poitier and that, oh really uh, yeah wow. so it was, it, at the time it was kind of a big movie um, it was just Hollywood in the early 60s it wasn't ready to yeah, take on the uh, you know, the, the themes of the novel. Very different from today's world. Very different from today's world. Just a good direction, yeah. you know, and, and good to see. And it's, yeah. it's amazing to see that, that, even for you to say that, like Sidney Poitier, the B-second fiddle now, I take nothing away from Paul Newman, as great as an actor as he yeah. is. Sidney Poitier, like, was, he's like one of those iconic, you know, figures in, yep. in, in the industry. Yep. That, you know, it's just, it's funny to see that and at there was a time when, right. you know, he became second fiddle, but... Uh, that is that is amazing. In fact, yeah, that was 1960, I mean, 61, 62, something like that. So, early in in his career, as well. That's amazing. I actually want to read that book. Sorry, I wanted to write down the title. And the movie is now streaming on the Criterion Channel. If you have that. Oh, so. okay. Very yeah. cool. Very cool. Well, I, you know, that's kind of led me into. Um, you went on. Now, when did you really get started into? I know you were an acting person. You did Broadway and. Right. Uh, you, you did movies, television, everything. As a so. child actor, yeah. Oh, really? Yep. Anything of note that I might not know? Or? Uh, nothing I want to admit to. Huh? <laughs> but um, yeah, I had as a kid, I had a I had an okay career as a child actor, and uh, after I got out of college, um, I was just like another twenty-something guy with a resume in New York City competing with everyone else and everyone who had moved to New York and you uh, I, I was talking to um, some acting students today at Shenandoah University um, here in Winchester and um, 
was telling them, you know, you really, you have to love it more than anything because it's a very difficult lifestyle, a constant rejection. You cannot beat yourself up after an audition. You just have to kind of go in and do your best and move on to the next. And uh, that lifestyle after I got out of college was, um, was was not for me, let's put it that way. And um, I had, I, but I also did love filmmaking and had an opportunity to go work for Roger Corman. And so I grabbed that and just kept going in that direction. Yeah, that, that's actually, um, yeah, one of the things I wrote down that I want to talk about was Roger Corman. I, I look up to Roger Corman a lot, especially because I, I came from a producing background. Uh -huh. So, and there's a guy who never lost money, <laughs> you know, never lost a dime, you know, his book, but, um, and he's just a, he's a polarizing figure when you hear him talk too. So, and when I heard that you would work for him, like when he's very, when I say polarizing, I mean like maybe not polarizing, but influential in the film, like with how he's done so much, made so many movies, right? And yet it's almost like a niche, like you know his his movies, like you have to love the cult, you know, like he didn't get the recognition he deserved, I guess I should. right? Well, I mean, the interesting thing about Roger is if 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 he if he were a film school and you look at the graduates of his film school, uh, it, it you know it, you're more successful filmmakers than NYU and USC and UCLA and you know all the film schools combined. Um, and just in, you know in terms of directors, Francis Coppola, Martin Scorsese, Jonathan Demme, and the list goes on and on and on. Actors, uh, Jack Nicholson, Sylvester Stallone, you know, it just, again, and, and even behind um, the camera, when you get into like the, the technicians, you have a Academy Award winning directors of photography. The first two movies I did for Roger Corman, Wally Pfister shot, who, you know, has won, a, won an Academy Award and has, has done amazing work with Christopher Nolan. So, uh, yeah, when you look at, at, at the movies, I, I love them. Um, some are hit, some are miss. Um, they are, I guess, what many people call kind of exploitation movies. Um, and but but he, you know, he, he's given a lot of young, inexperienced people their first break and their first opportunity, and I'm one of them. Yeah, and true, and it's truly amazing too. Like yeah, you know, you started out in the uh, ad department, there, right? Advertising for. Uh, was it Concord New Horizons? Concord New Horizons, that's right. That was my first job for him, was um, was head of marketing. And uh, we're sitting in this room and I'm looking around <laughs> at all these posters and thinking what would what what would uh, Roger approve of and what you know what, what would because some of these posters were like Pacific Rim, you know, uh, these are really, you know, kind of the same things that Roger uh, that we were doing for Roger, like um, you know, there's a Beauty and the Beast poster with all these faces, um, you know. They're not. There's not quite as much sex on, on some of these posters <laughs> here that uh, Roger had front and center on the posters that we did. But um, but a lot of yeah, a lot of what we did and a lot of what I learned, and, and even in terms of storytelling and movie making, you know, you, uh, I learned a lot by starting in the ad department, seeing you know what is it? What is it about the story? What is it about the movie that you can? Put on a poster and sell, and what's and so you know someone today in the um, in the class asked me about the elevator pitch, which I guess is how do you, you know, sum up a movie if, if we were in an elevator yeah. together? And I was gonna say, well, I guess that's that's the same as the poster, you know, it's yeah. it's what's what's the one sentence uh, ad for the poster that um, you can sum up the movie. And, and yeah, that's what we've always took it as the log line. Just run in and <laughs> give that as quick as possible. But yeah, the poster is such an important part. Yeah. And uh, yeah, then you moved over to uh, vice president of production, correct? That's correct. Yeah. Oh, that's a it's amazing jump, and like, it seems like a um, maybe like a different and a big. What's the big differences between going into advertising? I know you always wanted to be into directing and things like that, so you were probably set to go into that production world. But how crazy was that jump from going from advertising to production? Uh, it was uh, it was obviously a bigger jump. It wasn't even necessarily a job I wanted because I wanted to direct. I, did, I wanted to get out of the office and get on the set and, and direct. And at that time, Roger was about to direct the first movie that he had directed in a 
over 10 years or 20 years or something like that. And that was uh, it was called Frankenstein Unbound. Oh, okay. And he and I and he knew I wanted to direct, and he said, okay, I'll give you a shot. I'll give you your directing shot. But first, the head of production was was moving on, and he said, I'm leaving to go to Italy to shoot this movie. So um, I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom, and you run the you you know run the studio while I'm gone, and then when I get back, we can. Uh, direct a movie, and I think I did. I, I must have done too good a job because he mm -hmm. kept me on as head of production for two years. He said I could direct a movie after one year, but he kept me on um, for two years, and that was that was my film school. I didn't go to film school, but what a film school! I produced twenty three movies, and some of them were great, some were really terrible, and I got to learn uh, learn on the job and, and learn from other directors' mistakes yeah. you know, uh, before I made them myself. Well, you you produced uh, Carnosaur, right? Yeah, uh, I don't remember. It's it's all a bit of a blur, but I was certainly <laughs> around. I know I have a tiny part in it, and yeah, I, I, I was head of production when when Carnosaur was made. Because I remember he was he did an episode of uh, Dinner for Five, the John Favreau show, where they all sit at dinner and they, they were just talking about. Oh, dinner. Roger did. Yeah. Oh, I have to see that. Probably one of the best episodes mm -hmm. too, because uh, the way he talked, he, everybody at the table shut up just to listen to Roger Corman because yeah. when he talks. Like you said, look who he's, he's created. Yeah, you know the, the jobs he's created, and, and he chooses his wor words carefully. Unlike myself, who tends to blather on and on and on, uh, Roger's very soft spoken, um, and yeah, he chooses his words carefully. So when he speaks, you listen. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I've read his book for um, you know because, like I said, getting into producing, you can't steer away from Roger Corman. He's one of the best. Yeah. But uh, so taking that, you know, your first. Um, production with him. Your first directing project was The Unborn, correct? Right. Is there something you wanted to ask about Carnosaur? Or oh, no. I, I, the reason I bring that up is because he talked about Carnosaur in, in that. And uh, Sorry, I, I uh, started moving away. Uh, oh, that's okay. So he was talking about how like when they made Carnosaur, they made a certain amount of money. And then that was the mark. And I guess as VP of production, you would know that, like better than anybody. That was like the mark, the budget. And then like when you make two, it would go down a little bit. But there was a certain point in between where he would say, okay, that's enough, Carnosaur 3 is done, <laughs> you know, right. or whatever it was. And I just, I like that uh, dynamic of, of his, the way he chose to base it on, you know, how much he was ever bring in. So like, Carnosaur made this much, this is our mark. If anything goes below that, mm -hmm. we'll stop making sequels. Interesting. So it was, it was real, it was, it was pretty cool. And I just, like I had seen your name attached to Carnosaur and he had used that. That's why I was like, correlating. Okay. It. But um, now you went to um, uh, going on. I want to kind sure. of talk about the the, um, the documentary. Well, oh, okay. oh, I'm sorry. Yes, yeah, right. that was your first um, production, correct? Right? right. That was the movie that, um, as as head of production, people would pitch me projects, and you know, I, I was sort of a. Uh, um, if you saw the movie uh, The Player. I, I, okay. I, I was sort of the low-budget exploitation Tim Robbins in the movie The Player. I wasn't the head of the studio. I didn't have final say, but people in that movie who would come in and pitch projects to Tim Robbins, and then he would take them to his boss, and his job was on the line. So I was kind of the low-budget exploitation uh, Tim Robbins character in, in Roger Corman's world, Roger, of course, being um, the boss. And this uh, treatment for this movie uh, came across my desk, uh, and it, it was what became The Unborn, and I, I liked it, and it had all the elements of movies that uh, attracted me to filmmaking. It, psycho it was horror. I loved horror. It had a psychological element to it, and I loved the films of, of like David Cronenberg and Roman Polanski. Their movies really spoke to me. Uh, and so I did not show that one to Roger. I told the writers, uh, I really like this, um, and... Uh, I want to do something with it, but just stand by. <laughs> and then finally, when um, it came uh, my time to pitch Roger something I wanted to direct, I showed him uh, uh, that treatment. And uh, the Child's Play movies were very popular at that time. I know they were on to like Child's Play 2 or 3 or something. And Roger didn't have uh, a movie like that. He had um, Munchies, which was kind of more like Gremlins, his Gremlins. But uh, I think he saw in the treatments for the unborn the opportunity to have like a little, it would have been a fetus, but a kind of a little creature, child's but you know, that was more chucky, more you know, horrific and, and dangerous and uh, would kill people. I wasn't 
interested in that aspect of the story so much. I was really interested in the psychological, the Rosemary's Baby repulsion potential of it. So we had a little bit of a difference of opinion. I think if you look at the movie, I think I won. I think it's like 70% psychological, maybe 30% child's play. Yeah. Um, but that was, uh, yeah, that was, that was uh, how I got into directing. And that was my first experience as a director. And, I, and it's and it just um, got re-released on uh, Blu-ray by oh, Screen yeah. Factory. Screen Factory did a fantastic uh, 2K restoration of it, uh, and it's beautiful. And again, Wally Pfister. I'm looking. I'm looking at a poster of a movie uh, he directed, Transcendence, <laughs> right now. Yeah, Wally Pfister shot that. And you mentioned Carnosaur. It all comes around. Carnosaur was directed by my friend Adam Simon, mm -hmm. who uh, I knew from college, and. Uh, Adam's movie, Brain Dead, uh, also got re released uh, by Screen Factory. And so Adam interviewed me for the director's commentary on the Unborn re release. And then I interviewed Adam for the director's commentary on his movie, Brain Dead. And in true Roger Corman fashion, we did them back to back, which Roger would have loved because they got two audio commentaries out of one booking of a recording studio. So That is awesome. Yeah. That's really cool. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to pick that up. Actually, that and Brain Dead, I am a fan of both. And uh, I didn't know that they were uh, just released on Blu-ray, yeah. so that's really cool. Yeah, and they really did a beautiful job. And Screen Factory is. They, they've just been, they've been bringing back such an array of, like, beautiful movies, like like you said, like the Exploitation or the, mm -hmm. you know, the, uh, for lack of a better term, like the B-movies. Like yeah, that. but they really treat them with love and respect. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah. I do find that more and more of them are found have respect more so now than maybe at the time, mm -hmm. which is great to see. Well, it's so interesting with with um, labels also like Vinegar Syndrome or Severin or uh, Code Red. Even uh, so many of these movies look so much better than they ever did, or some of them even have a right to look. I mean, I grew up very close to Forty Second Street back in the heyday of the the grimy. Grindhouse days of 42nd Street, and I saw some of these movies, some of the Lucha Fulcher movies, and they were banged up prints, and you know they 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 look terrible. And now they're finding the original um, camera negatives and doing these beautiful 2K and sometimes 4K scans, and it's like how you know <laughs> they look better than ever. So we're sort of in a golden age of appreciation for um, these B movies or exploitation. Movies. Absolutely, and it is great to see. Yep. Uh, so you were going back and you were saying when you went to school, uh, you went to Harvard, correct? Uh, I did. And you studied documentary filmmaking? I did. When I was at Harvard, it's a little different. It's different now. Um, and uh, a lot of directors are, uh, are, are coming out of the program because they do. But when I, when I was at Harvard, it was, it was only documentary filmmaking. That was, that was it. And um, Ed Pincus passed away recently did, did a movie called Diaries, which was fantastic. And Ross McElwee who um, did documentaries, did Sherman's March, yeah. among many others. Um, they were, you know, my, kind of my teachers and mentors there. And um, I, I did it only because uh, that was it there at the time. You know, I had no other choice. And I'm really glad because I totally fell in love with documentary filmmaking. And had a, it opened, you know, those two guys opened my eyes to the fact that documentary is much more than, you know, some dry... You know, historical uh, uh, history class, or a nature movie about polar bears, or something. You know, now because of Netflix and uh, documentaries, you know, uh, so many different kinds of crime documentaries, sex documentaries. I mean, yeah. so many more of them are available and are and are fascinating. And even, you know, the explosion of reality TV. I think uh, audiences today are are so used to. Uh, non-fiction narratives, but it wasn't it wasn't always that way. No, yeah, and I, actually it's pretty funny because uh, uh, Ross McElwee that you were talking about, um, he received a Lifetime Achievement Award at the Full Frame Film Festival in 2007, and I actually uh, worked that one as a projectionist. Oh, wow. So I, I just, I saw that. I wasn't, I saw the montage mm -hmm. uh, that they had made, the, the cut of uh, things for him, um, but I, I was not in the room with that happened I was off <laughs> okay. showing something else but I had just I, when I was doing my research I saw that I thought that was pretty cool um, but uh, you are no stranger documentaries yourself you made two very good documentaries I've seen uh, I really love that you know I really like the um, let them let them eat rock yeah which I have just watched recently getting ready for everything and 
How did you find it? Is it's on YouTube. Oh, it is on YouTube. Yeah, the cut that's on YouTube, someone uploaded that. That's that's not even the final cut of the movie. That's something that, that, that was like a festival cut that I had submitted oh, to really? festivals to sort of oh. leak somehow. But whatever, people get a chance to see it. No, I definitely, I want to see not, it. It's not Copy. that different than the, than the than the final version, but um, it gives people like yourself an opportunity to, to see yeah, it. Yeah, and I definitely want to see because uh, I knew I want to talk a little bit about the documentary, but I was a big fan of uh, Conor Bryan being stopped. And uh, you were you wrote for um, uh, the Harvard Life Boom, correct? Right. And now is that how you met Conan O'Brien? Is that how you guys got together for? That is, he was president, and I was uh, uh, I had a sillier name, but I was kind of a vice president under his presidency. So oh, terrible. Uh, we go way back, and and it's interesting you mentioned those two movies, Let Them Eat Rock and Conan O'Brien Can't Stop, because uh, you know I made them ten years apart, but they're sort of. A, a, uh, Let Them Eat Rock is about a local, a very popular rock band out of Boston called The Upper Crust. And they were, at that time, I was filming, they were wildly popular locally. And they had just signed their first record deal and they just booked their first national TV appearance on Late Night with Conan O'Brien. And I thought it was an interesting time, kind of what I um, learned from Ross McElwee and uh, and at Harvard, I mean, at, at Pincus is kind of the more cinema verite style of documentary filmmaking, like to, just to film and see what happens, not necessarily make a documentary with, a, with an agenda, whether it's a political agenda, whatever. And I thought it was real. I, I thought it was an interesting time to capture a band because at that moment they were either going to explode and be Nirvana or not. Yeah. And, and even if and, if and either one is kind of interesting, right? Either one. And, it, and so, like, imagine a documentary filmmaker. Filming Nirvana when they were just popular yeah. locally and playing small gigs, so um, so I captured, uh, started filming the Upper Crust, and, and if you saw the movie, things happened within the band yeah. that <laughs> no one could have uh, predicted, and uh, and, I, and so it took many years. I kind of filmed that over over a five year period just because of very 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 surprising unpredictable things that happened within the band, and I'll spoil it. Um, and then, so cut to ten years later. So, so you know, film number one, very popular local band, popular with its fans locally, about to do its first national TV show, and what happens on the Conan O'Brien show? Ten years later, we got Conan O'Brien who loses a TV show. He was on the Tonight Show, and he lost that, and then decides to go on the road and do a series of live acts to personally connect with his fans on a local level. So it's a kind of like weird mirror inversion of one of the other, even involving Conan and, and like spiritual re cousins. reaching its audience. Yeah, I call them kind of bookends in a weird way. Mm -hmm. It's like one's an inversion, a weird inversion of the other, and they do kind of speak to each other it's interesting in a strange that, way. It's interesting that you put it that way, because when what, because I, like I said, Conan and Brian can't stop, I was a big fan of, because I followed that whole thing. I think he's the only host of the Tonight Show besides Shaquille Carson. Like, was on all the time. Like, I watched his yeah. every night. He was on. Yeah. And Johnny Carson was just on it with the family. Right. Um, so when he left, I found that just like a really interesting subject. Like, what's going on? And like, I want to see him succeed. Yeah, me too. Um, That's why I made that movie. Yeah, and it, and it was a fantastic documentary. But yeah, and now having watched uh, Let Them Eat Rock with the Upper Crust and seeing how that kind of came about. It, you're right, it is interesting, and, and I'm glad you put it that way because it, I see how it pulls together. You know, yeah. and it, that's just, that was, that was really awesome. But, uh, and uh, so we were going in, and I also want to talk to you about your uh, TV show, who's your TV director. You got into TV directing right around the time you were, right at, not shortly after you were directing, um, uh, you started directing The Unborn, and your second feature was. In the Heat of Fashion. In the Heat of Fashion, which you broke, too. I did. Yeah, I'm sorry, I have not seen that one. I did see The Unborn years ago, but yeah. I did not see that Yeah, that's kind of harder to see. It never came out on DVD. It, uh, it, it came out on VHS and Laserdisc. Um, but Screen Factory, Shout Factory, which you know bought the Roger Corman Library, they um, they have it. So, oh, nice. Okay. Uh, people want to see it. Um, right. Write to you know Shout Factory on their Facebook page and. They listen. They they see what fans want to want to uh, they see what fans want to see and watch and if you put uh, in the heat of passion on there. Who knows? Maybe they'll give that the, the same treatment they gave the unborn. Yeah. No, definitely. I will do that because yeah. um, I do want to see it. Uh, now we, uh, with the television, you, 
you, so you was shortly after that. You wanted, you, what was your first project? It was Tales from the Crypt? That was it. So, so, right. I had done those two films, and then I had done uh, um, Leprechaun 2. It was right around that time, and I am, as we mentioned, a former actor, and I really enjoy working with actors, and even like The Unborn was a horror film, but um, it, it's an emotional story, and I, Brooke Adams did an amazing job, uh, and I, it, it's a shame that um, actors in horror, you know, we just had the uh, Academy Awards, that more performances in horror films uh, aren't, aren't um, as seriously considered as other performances because it's really hard. It's, it's really hard to pull that off. Some of the great performances are in horror films. So I, I wanted to continue working with actors and it was uh, my agent at the time suggested TV that, you know, sort of what we now call peak TV, was, you know, uh, uh, TV was getting better around that time. And uh, because, the, you know, the really great scripts were going to be A-list directors and my Corman training of being able to shoot very quickly on a tight schedule uh, was great training for television because there's very little time in television to shoot. So um, yeah, Tales from the Crypt was kind of a natural bridge because of the, the, the horror and the exploitation I had done in my Corman training. But then after that, I started doing more TV dramas like um, Chicago Hope, and you mentioned Party of Five, mm -hmm. and after Party of Five, kind of fell into the teenage uh, high school niche with Dawson's Creek and the OC and shows like that. And now to speak on that, you also directed uh, Idle Hands, but that was in between while you were directing um, Let Them Eat the Cake, correct? Did, didn't you leave? Let right, well as I said, yeah, um, uh, there was like a, a five year break mm -hmm. uh, in filming of Let yeah. Them Eat Rock. It was too... Um, Rock, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's alright. You're not the first. <laughs> no, I just... It, uh, um, because, like I said, of, of very surprising and unpredictable um, dramatic circumstances within the band. Yeah. Uh, so, and um, so, yes, I did do uh, kind of idle hands between those two um, Which shooting segments of shooting. For I'm sure many young men were very appreciative of introducing Jessica Alba to everybody. <laughs> that wasn't, uh, yeah. It was the first time a lot of people had seen her. It wasn't her, it, it wasn't her first film. Uh, she'd done a TV show as well. I think she was on like the reboot of Flipper. I want to say, oh, time, was she? yeah, something like that. Yeah, so, so, um, so she was not brand new, but uh, you know, those uh, uh, we knew her star was rising. Nice, okay. And yeah, I mean, you had a great cast in that movie. It's, a, it's such an interesting and, and to kind of lead us into. And getting back, this is, it seems like sponsored by Shout Factory here, but they just. <laughs> Announced that they're going to be doing a definitive version of Idle Hands. That's all right. So. Yeah. I, I own the Blu ray, but I, I uh, not the Blu ray, I own the DVD. Yeah, well, it's going to be coming yeah, out in May, I think, April or May, I think they said. You've given me a lot of movies to watch yeah. here and, and buy, so thank you. Uh, but I, just to kind of lead that into talking about Ibrahim's Love, like, because it's the undead factor, as I'll call it. You know, like, <laughs> yeah, both have very undead <laughs> features in them, but yeah, it's such a terrific cast. It's a, it's a Really interesting original story uh, and take on things. Um, I don't know and how that worked out and played. So when you picked that up, like I know you were into horror and, and directing and uh, and being a part of that world. What did? You, but it's more comedy now. Now had you dealt with comedy beforehand? Uh, before getting into that movie, uh, Tales from the Crypt certainly uh, was comedic, and and you know that had a very you know. Based on a comic book, mm -hmm. it was an anthology show. So each 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 episode was like its own little movie, its own little short film. But it was very gory, and they certainly embraced the kind of grand guignol, uh, more comedic a aspect of things. Um, they, uh, um, I always did. You know, you, you mentioned um, I've been on the Harvard Lampoon with Conan, so comedy. I, I always did love comedy. I grew up like reading the National Lampoon, and uh, you know, Animal House came out that blew my mind, uh, and of course, like Mad Magazine. But um, 
getting back to Roger Corman, when I was a kid, I saw Little Shop of Horrors, his original Little Shop of Horrors on TV, and that blew my mind also. I just, I couldn't believe, like, someone actually, I, I didn't get it. I didn't understand, like, I, I, I couldn't believe that someone actually made that movie. It seemed like it was a movie that was made just for me. It's this, like, again, this weird blend of, of comedy and horror and, and the, Spoiler alert: The hero dies at the end, and I just but but it's done like comedically, and and I I, I didn't I it, it, I had to like track it down again, just like kind of figure it out, and so then when uh, I had the opportunity to uh, to work on Idle Hands, I wasn't the um, first director on that movie. It was uh, there were two other directors before me, wow. and they had a start date, and again it was I guess my Corman training and TV and the fact that I had done horror and had worked with teenagers and had done television and had done movies in 18 days and uh, to prep it very quickly and just sort of jump in um, uh, made me a, a, uh, a good match for that movie. Uh, so that was, yeah, so in terms of features that was kind of the first, um, my first um, mutation of, of comedy and horror together. And now with Eat Brains Love, which is uh, uh, streaming on Apple, uh, iTunes, Apple, Apple TV, and Amazon, and uh, Hulu, wherever else you uh, buy or rent movies. Um, it is. It is. It, it shares some DNA with Idle Hands. Um, you mentioned kind of the zombie undead aspect of it. I really, you know, I really don't um, consider Eat Brains Love a zombie movie, although it's certainly marketed that way. I kind of look at it more of a uh, of a road movie with zombies in it. Okay. Uh, yeah, and we haven't seen the movie yet, right? No, so, but I love that concept. Yeah, I'm yeah. going to see it tonight because they're showing it here at the Alamo right. Winchester. Right. Right. Uh, I do love the concept that I've been reading about with it. I didn't read the book either, so okay. I'm coming in so fresh. So you surprised. Great. And I'm, I'm very much looking forward to that. So, yeah. what attracted you to this? Was it the book, or, or did you read the script? And... Yeah, I. Uh, you know, my um, my. I'd been doing again a lot of TV and kind of wanted wanted to get back into um, movies, and I heard there was like this zombie comedy, and I'm you know, such a huge fan of like Shaun of the Dead, and I heard it was very low budget, and I felt like you know how can you compete with Walking Dead and and visual effects? You can't really compete with that on a low budget, and the whole zombie genre seemed so oversaturated, and even zombie comedies. Uh, you know, warm bodies uh, had, had had come out, and then um, I heard the title "Eat Brains Love," and I said, "Okay, I'm, I'm in. When do I start? How can I get in, be a part of this?" Um, and then I read the script, uh, um, which was adapted from the, from uh, the novel, and uh, it, I, I liked the. Um, well, you'll see, it's kind of this weird romantic triangle to. Um, paraphrase uh, the band New Order that's kind of like a bizarre love triangle and to me that's what interested me was again this emotional um, relationship between the three lead characters and there's undead and gut munching and gore and blood and all that stuff we love going on but um, it was this sort of core relationship that was in the book and Mike Yarrow and Dave Strauss uh, who, who adapted um, the screenplay Jeff Hart uh, wrote the original novel uh, that, that even though the, the book uh, was very ambitious and if you were gonna do that book as a movie exactly it would have probably like an Avengers like you know budget very um, very ambitious uh, so they brought it down and they made it doable on a lower budget but that core relationship of the three leads um, remained the same and that you can do on any budget you know it's a, just a relationship between three people which like you said an oversaturated um Sub genre or subgenre of zombies, uh, I think that comes as a refreshing notion. Like you, you are now fo you're not focused on the zombie world of zombies, like The Walking Dead, or right. you know, you're focused on these relationships. And it is a, overall, from what I've seen, and I'm looking forward to watching later, um, a uh, you know, not just a horror comedy, like you said, or a zombie movie. It is mm -hmm. a road trip movie. Yeah. With love it in it. And yeah. These characters, and I like your twist that I've seen from the trailer. Of they kind of switch back and forth. The hunger is what takes them over in terms right. of zombies. Yeah, I, I haven't seen that before, so that's a refreshing take okay. as well. So, Great. Um, 
Well, I really appreciate you, Rodney. I really appreciate you uh, being on the show, and I really look forward to the movie and okay. seeing everything else. Uh, we've mentioned a lot of movies out there, everybody. Yeah. So get to Shout Factory, get those movies, check them out. You know, they're very good. And check out Eat Brains Love on yes. iTunes. Yes, the, number one. Go out there and check it out. Yeah. So thanks again. Really appreciate it. Thank you. And uh, take care, everybody.